Welcome to Numerical Methods. And yeah, we are still in our section on the numerical approximation of partial derivatives. So we derived several formulas to approximate partial derivatives. So one was the forward finite difference. So actually, at first, this is a formula to represent the first order derivative of a function here by a finite difference, upshifted value minus unshifted value divided by the shift size, and then plus an error term, a residual term, but you see that this error term here becomes small if the shift becomes small. Yeah? So if we just drop this term here, okay, those, then we have an approximation. This is obtained by using Taylor's formula with, say, one shift size and up to n equals one. We also derived the central finite difference yeah, using two shift sizes, upshift and downshift. And then we get the formula that our partial derivative here is a finite difference with upshift minus downshift value divided by two times the shift size and then plus another residual term. And that guy has now order h squared. So the central finite difference has a better approximation order, smaller approximation error if, yeah, say the derivative, it's the different derivative here is you know, in a similar scale and the shift size is in a similar scale but small. So this result, um, yeah, so these results suggested that we should choose our shift size h, yeah, very small, to achieve a low approximation error. But we had a nice numerical experiment that showed that this is not true. And our numerical experiment was the approximation of the exponential functions derivative uh, at x equals zero. Uh, you know analytically this derivative is equal to one. So if we then plot the approximation error for different shift sizes, so we did some experiments with different shift sizes, we got this picture here, for example. And you see for very small shifts, there is a large error here. And for large shifts, there's also an increasing error. So we had a very good understanding here for what's going on in this region. So that was this picture in the script. And we could really elaborate yeah, why this looks as such. Yeah, It is because there is a rounding error in our calculation. The thing that creates these jumps is here that we round to a floating point number to the nearest representation in the floating point numbers. So whenever we have a rounding to the next representation number, we have such a such jump. Yeah? So the jump size will then decrease if the shift becomes larger because we divide by the shift. That means we have now a force that pushes us in the opposite direction. So computer arithmetic tells us choose a large shift because if the shift is too small, the rounding error you know, is becoming significant. So now we have the question, what is the optimal shift size? So I would like to derive now an error estimate yeah, for the first order finite difference that includes the two aspects. Yeah? So on one side, there is the Taylor expansion residual term error, yeah? so which tells me, okay, choose a small shift size. And on the other side, yeah, there's the computer arithmetic rounding error induced error that tells me, okay, choose a large shift size. Yeah? And somewhere in between is the optimal shift size. Maybe if you go back here to our numerical experiment, yeah, we can 
search a little bit for the optimal shift size. Yeah? So uh, it looks a little bit at it, as it, if it's here between, say, yeah, 10 to the minus 12 and 10 to the minus 2. Yeah? You can look here. Okay, maybe still there. Okay, yeah, now it's large here. So large there. Maybe you could zoom in a little bit again. Yeah, here it's still larger. Okay, so maybe around a little bit to the left, maybe now. Yeah, maybe around a 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 8, somewhere there could be an optimal shift. Yeah, so quite far away from what you think that this is maybe a small shift. Okay, so motivation is that lemma 101, yeah, so the Taylor expansion error term suggests that we should choose our shift size as small as possible. However, computer arithmetic yeah, gives us that we have the floating point rounding of the results. So the two results, the upshifted value and the downshifted values are rounded. And this introduces an error. And now the differential, upshifted value minus downshifted value, is divided by the error. So this rounding error is then uh, amplified. Or in the worst case, if the two values are rounded to the same value, because the shift is so small, so very small, uh, in this case, they are rounded to the same value and we will calculate a derivative of zero. So that was in our picture for the exponential function. This region here, yeah, where in the finite difference, both values were rounded to the same value and our finite difference told us the derivative is zero, but it should be one. So let's work now from the object that we would like to calculate. This is the partial derivative of our function v towards the calculation that we are actually performing. So the first step is that we are approximating our partial derivative dv by dx with a finite difference approximation. So if we use forward finite differences, this is upshifted value minus the unshifted value divided by the shift size. So this is the error that comes from the Taylor expansion. And in our case, it is a constant, say C2 times H half, that is our error bound, C2, because it is a constant related to the second derivative. So C2 should be a bound to the second derivative. In our Taylor expansion, the residual term was second derivative times h squared half, but then we divided by 1h, so it is C2 times h divided by 2. Okay, so next thing is that we actually perform these calculations here in the computer. So there is another approximation error, and this is maybe some approximation error, say alpha. So there is a difference between the true upshifted value and the numerical implementation of the upshifted value. And this error, say, is bounded by some alpha. So let's consider to have the same alpha also for the unshifted value. So there is a difference between the true value of the function and the computer implementation of the function. And that difference is my uh, constant here, alpha. At that point, yeah, note that this alpha could be just a rounding error. Like, for example, for our exponential function. The exponential function is, as we know, exact yeah, with respect to IEEE 754 rounding. 
This means there's no additional approximation error. However, in our application, like for example, Monte Carlo simulation uh, whatsoever, there could be an additional error. So this alpha here could be just a rounding error. So if this is just a rounding error, then it means that the best thing that we can hope for is that alpha is around the machine precision, but the machine precision is a relative error. So you have that rounding number z to the nearest representation float set yeah, for the normalized floating point numbers. This has the error epsilon times z, yeah, because we have increasing scales, yeah, it is proportional to the scale on which we are, epsilon times z, where the epsilon is the machine precision. So if this alpha is just this, yeah, just the rounding error, we know that the alpha is in the region of epsilon times c0, where the c0, sorry, where c0 is now a bound to the function. But the alpha could be more. Uh, as I mentioned, the alpha could also be a Monte Carlo error. Uh, so that's also in there. Uh, when you move now from the V to the V tilde, it means that I move to my actual implementation of the function in the computer. So there is some approximation error. Uh, alpha, the yeah, best thing we can hope for is that alpha is just epsilon machine precision times C0. Okay, so we are calculating this finite difference here in the computer. Yeah? So this result will also be rounded. Yeah? So I take the difference of the two values and this result will also be rounded to the nearest representation in the computer. So there is an additional step. Yeah, I will now round this result. Yeah, So my result of the finite difference. So this is the upshifted value calculated in the computer minus the downshifted value calculated in the computer divided by h. Yeah? So this will be rounded to the nearest floating point number. So what's the difference? Yeah, the difference is also yeah, some machine precision error, and the error is yeah, of the order epsilon times C0. But now divided by H, yeah, because we move to the smaller, the smaller scale. Yeah? So you, you see that we have a machine precision error. Um, epsilon times C0, uh, but since we could have cancellation here, uh, uh, so this, this error lives in the scale. Yeah? So this is the error that comes from here, the operation minus. Yeah? So this error lives in the scale of V tilde, and then we divide by, uh, divide by H. Yeah. So this is due to the subtraction introducing another error, no? the, the cancellation. So now I can combine the two steps yeah, from the true finite difference to the computer implementation of the finite difference. And I have that taking the finite difference using my computer implementation of the function v divided by h, rounding it then to the nearest floating point number, this deviates from the true finite difference, so taking the upshifted value minus the unshifted value, dividing by the shift size, yeah? this deviates now by two times alpha. So alpha was the error coming from the function implementation. It could be epsilon C0, but could be more, plus epsilon times C0 yeah, coming from 
rounding the finite difference again. Everything divided by h yeah, multiplied with uh, with two, yeah, because actually I have two two functions inside. Okay, so if you have this remark here that the best you can hope for alpha is to be in the region of epsilon times c zero. Then you see that the best you have here is four epsilon times c zero divided by h. Yeah? C zero, the scale of the function, so for my exponential function, which is around zero, c zero is one, yeah? uh, a little bit larger than one, yeah? take a two if you like, a bound to the function value. On the other, estimate the C2, on the Taylor expansion, estimate the C2 was a bound on the second derivative. Okay, so you see that this error term here becomes smaller if H becomes larger. So these are the error terms related to computer arithmetic and the implementation of the function. While this error term here becomes smaller if h becomes smaller. So now let's compose our two estimates. The estimate coming from the true finite difference to the computer implementation and the estimate coming from the partial derivative we would like to approximate to the true finite difference. So we have that in summary, approximating our partial derivative with a computer implementation of the upshifted value minus the downshifted value divided by the shift size. So a computer implementation of the finite difference rounded to the nearest floating point number. So this is to be estimated by two alpha plus Epsilon C0, uh, function implementation error, and machine precision times scale of the function, divided by H plus one half C2 multiplied with H. Okay, so now I would like to find the minimum of this right-hand side. I mean, that's a bit sloppy because this is an estimate. Yeah? It could be that the optimal value lies in a different region, yeah? but then at least I have the optimal estimate. Yeah? So let's minimize this right-hand side as a function of h. Yeah? So what is the best value for h such that this expression here becomes as small as possible. So we see this right-hand side as a function of h, and we would like to minimize this. Yeah. So differentiate with respect to h. So if you differentiate the 1 divided by h, you get a minus 1 divided by h squared. Yeah? So you have a minus here and an h squared. If you differentiate here, yeah, you just get the constant 1 half c2. So the minimum is attained at minus 2 times alpha plus c0 times epsilon divided by h squared plus 1 half c2 equals 0. So solve for h, you find, yeah, okay, multiply with h squared, divide by one half c2, yeah, bring the stuff on the other side, you have h squared is equal to actually a four times alpha plus epsilon c0 divided by c2, take the square root, you get a two times square root of alpha plus epsilon C0 divided by C2. So the best thing that we can have is
So if the alpha is the epsilon times C0, it is two times square root of two epsilon C0 divided by C2. Okay, so this is square root of eight C0 divided by C2 times epsilon. Eh? So this is the best we can get if now the implementation is actually accurate up to machine precision. So you see here in my estimate, there are constant related to the scale of the function value and the scale of the second derivative. For our experiment with the exponential function, so this guy is a bound to the function value. Yeah, the function is the exponential function, say, in the interval from, uh, it's around zero, so from minus one to one, um, exponential function is bounded by exponential one, Yeah, so that is, say, bounded by three. Yeah? Um, and that here is a bound to the second derivative. Yeah. Um, okay, so second derivative of the exponential function is also the exponential function, so maybe it's also just the same bound. So for our case, uh, the function value and the second derivative of the function lie on the same scale. Yeah, they have the same order of magnitude. So this part here is actually a one. So you see that my optimal shift size is a square root of the epsilon. So now you know my machine precision is epsilon equal to 10 to the minus 16. Taking the square root of the 10 to the minus 16 gives me a 10 to the minus 8. So this is somewhere the region where we should have the optimal shift size. Let's try this out in the computer. So we have here our nice little program. And now let's plot maybe the region where the scale of the shift size is from minus 10 to minus six, yeah? So the shift is from 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus six. Yeah? So let's create these plots. Okay, so here on the left, yeah, you have all the shift sizes from 10 to the minus 20, yeah, to the 10 to the minus one. And now I have zoomed in yeah, to the region from 10 to the minus 10, to a 10 to the minus six. And you see here on the left side, there is the oscillations coming from all these small rounding errors. And on the right side, there is the second order effect, yeah, the error from the Taylor expansion. And somewhere in between, there is the optimal value. And indeed, it's around a 10 to the minus eight. Okay, we found uh, the optimal shift size. And uh, surprisingly, yeah, it's uh, not a very small shift. Yeah, so maybe intuitively you would choose a ten to the minus twelve or ten to the minus ten. Yeah, and these are not the optimal guys. So you have this figure, these two figures here in the script. Yeah, so this is now here for the one-sided finite difference for the forward finite difference, and if we zoom in to the region from 10 to the minus 10 to the 10 to the minus 6, you see that somewhere here the optimal value is around a 10 to the minus 8. Of course, we can repeat this little exercise now for our central finite difference. Yeah, what changes Yeah, is not much because the central finite difference is also a finite difference, it was now upshifted value minus downshifted value divided by 2h. That is now our finite difference that approximates the partial derivative. But we got a better estimate. So it was a bound on the third derivative. So C3 times h squared divided by six. Yeah, so C3 is now a bound on the third derivative. All the other parts of the calculations are actually 
the same. Yeah? So we have a finite difference that we use. This finite difference is created from computer implementation, then rounded to the nearest floating point number. So it is the computer implementation of the upshifted value minus the computer implementation of the downshifted value divided by 2h you know, that we calculate and then round to the nearest floating point number that we have to compare to the true value for the upshifted value minus the true value of the downshifted value divided by 2h where the bound on the right hand side is exactly the same yeah i have an error alpha in the implementation of the v tilde the difference from v tilde to v and i have another error epsilon c is zero due to this rounding of the finite difference to the nearest floating point number everything is divided by 2h so this part here stays actually the same this is the same error as before what changes is this guy here the guy that comes from the Taylor Taylor expansion. So this guy is now a one divided by six C three H squared. Yeah? The other guy is still a two alpha plus epsilon C zero divided by, okay, now a two H because I have this additional two in the finite difference. Okay, so that's the difference from the partial derivative we would like to approximate. So now let's minimize this bound here. Yeah? So find the optimal value of h. So I would like to minimize this function. So again, differentiate with respect to h, differentiating with respect to h gives me a 2h here. And as before, um, minus 1 divided by h squared here. So I have a minus 1 divided by h squared here. And here I have now a 1 divided by 3 times h. Solve for h. So this means I multiply with h squared. Multiplying with h squared gives me an h to the power of 3 here. I then divide by 1 divided by 3 times c3. Yeah, So this is a 3 times yeah, this stuff here divided by c3. This is the h to the power of 3. I take the third root and I have now my optimal value for the shift size. This is 3 times alpha plus epsilon C0 divided by C3 to the power of 1 divided by 3, yeah? the third root. And also, if we are in the special situation that my alpha is just epsilon C0, uh, then we get a 6 times C0 divided by C3 times epsilon, and from that, the third, third root. So now if epsilon is a 10 to the minus 16, and you also note that in our experiment, C3 is a bound to the third derivative of the function. The function was the exponential function. Exponential function, third derivative is still the exponential function. So in our experiment, the ratio here of this two scales, yeah, function value divided by scale of third derivative is still around one. So we can maybe drop this guy here in our experiment with the exponential function. So this means I just take the third root of six times epsilon, yeah. So taking the third root of a 10 to the minus 16 yeah, is something like a 10 to the minus the 16 divided by three. Let's say it's, it's a 10 to the minus five. So I would expect the optimal shift size for the centered finite difference for this exponential function experiment around a 10 to the minus 5. You see, I should choose now a larger shift because why? So you see, you have a better 
approximation error here in the Taylor expansion error. So that means the approximation error for large values of H is sm becoming smaller. While the computer arithmetic problem is still the same. So it means you can now move further to the right yeah, to use larger shift sizes yeah, because your approximation error is not so depending on choosing very, very small shift sizes. Okay, so I can use a larger shift. So 10 to the minus five. Let's check that in the computer. So you see that I also implemented here the plotting function that we used before for the centered finite difference. So maybe you can just peek into the implementation here. So this is the plotting function for the centered finite difference. So everything is just the same, except that I'm now calculating the finite difference approximation using the central finite difference upshifted value minus downshifted value divided by two times the shift size. Yeah, let's plot this. So um, you see this here is the full range from 10 to the minus 20 to 10 to the minus one. Yeah, And now we zoomed in a little bit from a 10 to the minus seven to a 10 to the minus four. And indeed it looks okay. This is, has still noise here. Okay, the noise is becoming smaller. And then at some point here, the higher order error kicks in. It really looks like a 10 to the minus five being the optimal shift size yeah, for the central finite difference. But important for the exponential function, yeah, because there's still a ratio that is related to the scales of the function value and one of its derivatives. So for the central finite difference, Let's also mark this here in the script. The optimal shift size is maybe somewhere around here. At 10 to the minus five. You saw that I also plotted our little picture that we had when we try to understand what's going on for the central finite difference. So maybe just compare this one. So it was the range from 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus 14. Maybe just compare this one to the forward finite difference. So let me close these and also plot the corresponding one for the forward finite difference. So I only like to see now the range from 10 to the minus 16.5 to 10 to the minus 14 for the forward finite difference and for the centered finite difference. Yeah, you see that the situation is similar. Yeah, so there is noise due to jumps, but now you have a little bit different way of jumping. And this is because in the finite difference, the two valuations. So the upshifted value and the downshifted value, they jump at different points. Yeah. So you, of course, you do not have synchronicity uh, in these jumps. So if you make h larger, yeah, suddenly one valuation here is rounded to the next floating point number, and then you make h a little bit larger again, and then the other valuation is rounded to the next floating point number. So this is the reason why you see this pattern here. And you also have these uh, pictures here in the script. Yeah? So this is the one-sided, our forward finite difference. And this is now the centered finite difference. Explanation for this pattern is that that the upshift and the downshift value jump at different different points. 
I would like to make a, another interesting comment here about this um, estimate. Yeah, so this estimate looks maybe a little bit strange. Yeah, you have these constant here, uh, c zero divided by c two, and then you have a square root here. Okay, for the forward finite difference. For the central finite difference, I have now a different constant here, C0 divided by C3, and then I have suddenly um, a third root. And what I really like to do is, uh, like in physics, use units to get an understanding of a formula or to check the plausibility of a formula. Yeah, and what are the units of these objects? Well, note Epsilon is a unitless quantity. Yeah, it is the machine precision is multiplied with the value of the function. Yeah, so if the function v is measuring something, say in meter, yeah, then epsilon is the relative error, so it is unitless. Epsilon times the function value is an error in meter. So this guy has no unit. Well, if the function is measuring something in meter, then the bound C0 also has the unit meter. Yeah, it is a bound on the function value meter. But now the argument, what is the argument X, yeah, my or, or my H? Yeah? Consider that the argument is something like a time, yeah. So it's measuring time, it's in seconds. What is then the second derivative? Yeah, the first derivative is meter per seconds. How does the function value change if time changes? And the second derivative is meter per second squared. How does the first derivative change if the time changes? So the first derivative is a velocity. The second derivative is an acceleration. So you see that this is something called in meter, and this is something in meter per second squared. So if you divide now meter by meter per second squared, you get something in second squared. So the square of the unit of the argument of the function. From that, you take the square root and you get the unit of the argument of the function. So that's a unit in seconds. And h is a shift to the argument. It's a shift to the argument, so it has to be it has to have units seconds. So from the units, yeah, this formula looks really plausible. Yeah? It is C0 divided by C2 yeah, times a unitless quantity, epsilon, and from that, the square root. The same happens for the central finite difference. Yeah? C0 has the units of the function, in my example, meter, C3 has the units of the third derivative. So this has the unit of jerk, yeah? the change of an acceleration. Yeah? In my example, it would be meter per second to the power of three. So meter divided by meter per second to the power of three is a second to the power of three. So it's the unit of the argument to the power of three multiplied with a unit less quantity. Take the third root and you have a quantity in the unit of the arguments. So there's a nice way of interpreting or verifying the formula. Yeah. So these guys here, the square root of C0 divided by C2, or the third root of C0 divided by C3, they have the unit yeah, of the um, um, argument. Yeah? So this has the unit of, of, of x. Okay, so here are now the, the results of our little uh, session on this error estimate, yeah, summarized in a little lemma. Yeah? So you see all these bounds again, a bound to the function value, a bound to the second derivative, a bound to the third derivative. Uh, you also have here our bound to the function implementation, yeah, our alpha, so difference between function implementation and true value of the function. And 
we summarize here the result for the one-sided finite difference and the central or centered finite difference. Yeah, that was it for approximation of the partial derivative via finite differences. You find all the code again in our lecture repository, yeah, and you can maybe play a little bit with this. For example, I also have in the code here, yeah, which we did not do, I did not calculate an approximation of the third order derivative. So in this case, we have to use a double upshifted value. Yeah? So 2h, a shift of 2h up and a shift of minus 2h. Yeah? So double downshifted value, the upshifted value and the downshifted value. And we have a little bit more complicated finite difference formula for this. So that's the case where you now take the four equations yeah, and you cancel all the derivatives such that the third derivative uh, is left over. Okay, and you know the analytic solution is still the exponential function and we can plot the error. So this is now the third order derivative and you see that in that case, actually the optimal value of the shift size, this looks around to be a 10 to the minus three, yeah? So far away from being, being small. Uh, well, the error here uh, has a much higher order because also we use many, many different uh, shifts. Yeah, we cancel many different terms in the Taylor expansion. Okay, that was it.